tonight in Panorama, we see the security problem on the ground in South Armagh, and we have an interview with the Prime Minister. And we return to some of the victims of the economic recession who last summer were leaving school one day and joining dole queues the next. Now a new scheme is offering youngsters a number of specially invented, properly paid jobs. Nice work if you can get it, as they say themselves. We'll be asking how many people this job creation plan is really helping. This afternoon in the House of Commons, Harold Wilson announced still more measures to tighten up security in South Armagh. More checks, more surveillance. And we'll be talking to him later about both security and the political future of Ulster. There was going to have been an Ulster debate today anyway to talk about the future government of the province. But events in Armagh, the least typical part of Ulster in many ways, have made it specially important. South Armagh down here is almost wholly Roman Catholic. And the border area with the south down here has been a provisional IRA stronghold with ambushes, sectarian killings, ferocious gun battles across the border. Here, last year's ceasefire really meant very little indeed. Merlin Rees, the Minister for Northern Ireland, called South Armagh bandit country as the sectarian killings of both Protestants and Catholics spiralled. After the murder of five Catholics one night, a week ago today there was the White Cross massacre when 11 Protestants were lined up and shot at an isolated crossroads. After these outrages, the government took the view the immediate task in Armagh was to protect lives. Michael Charlton reports. Sudden and dramatic reinforcement of troops has doubled the army's strength in South Armagh in the last week. It's too dangerous for the army to move in vehicles along the border roads of this county without presenting the IRA with easy targets and thus propaganda victories. Wherever possible, the army goes by air. Colonel Philip Davis commands the Royal Scots Battalion in Armagh. And you see the problem here. He's very scattered to our houses. One will be Catholic, one Protestant. A very mixed community in this area. And of course, it's extremely difficult to provide adequate protection to anybody of any persuasion living in these isolated areas. There is a great deal of fear in this area at the moment. And I know that certain of the locals, both from the Protestant and the Catholic side, are moving into each other's houses at night to give themselves confidence and added protection. I have no evidence at the moment that large numbers in any way are moving out of the area. There may have been the odd one or two. In this part of the United Kingdom, 100 people have been murdered since 1970, 56 in the last six months. The immediate interest in South Armagh is whether, following the spate of sectarian butcheries along these lonely country roads, it will mark the descent of Ulster into an even more degrading chaos. But Armagh also dramatises afresh the issue of the border itself, and to the mounting restiveness of the Protestants. Small British towns like Newry and Crossmaglen openly flaunt the Republican flag. Uh, the people are not friendly. They're not on the other hand, they're virtually hostile, but clearly very strong Republican sympathizers. I have a base here in the RUC station. We have six police here, and we operate out of Crossland itself, and we also maintain quite a large presence in here. There is the base right down there where the corrugated iron is and our helicopters land. But uh, the Queen's Rift does not run here. In Crossmaglen, it takes all the professional skills of the army to make it safe enough for the Royal Ulster Constabulary to walk around the town where they are charged with maintaining law and order. Two of them have been gunned down here. Until last September, the police had not been able to carry out any police duties for more than two years. It's a Catholic, Republican stronghold, and only one Protestant lives here. It's been possible to reintroduce the police to their own town only with army security bristling like porcupine quills all around them.
In Armagh, unlike the rest of the United Kingdom, there is no question of the population as a whole lining up behind the forces of law and order. For that authority itself is the very thing which is so bitterly disputed. In Cross Maglen, not only can the IRA find safety, it's an effective control of the population. Sergeant, when you bring the RUC constables out like this, what sort of things are they asking in, in the shop, for example? Well, sometimes they come along to serve um, road summonses yeah. for motoring offences. Yeah. Uh, that's mainly the task. They just come out to meet the people, talk to the people, and just to show a presence on the ground. You ready, boys? security forces in South Armagh, and particularly here, get no help at all in arresting the drift to a state approaching anarchy. Both communities, when under the thumb of the gunmen, seem determined to prove their incompatibility. And that is the basic dilemma of the liberal approach in Britain's present policy, which expects compromise and reconciliation. And so the security forces are thanked by no one and are either accused of falling down on security or violating civil rights. Police stations in Northern Ireland, like the law itself, are under siege. 57 policemen have been killed since the IRA began its latest campaign in 1970. Like the troops who guard and support them as the civil power, the police are lifted in and out by helicopter. In the fortified police barracks at Cross McGlen and in the town, Colonel Davis and the soldiers of the Royal Scots can maintain their military presence without difficulty. But they make it clear that they can do nothing about the town's Republican allegiance. And that is the political problem. There is the border in there, uh, just the other side of the border, where a lot of fairly hard line people do be. Uh, we know that. You, you know that the IRA meet the in that farm, do you? Uh, we know that hard line professionals do meet in that farm, yes. Yeah. And that's the factory that they have. That's right. Yeah. Can, you, can you answer to the best of your knowledge uh, this, this question about whether you believe most of the operations inside our bar by the IRA are based inside our bar itself or come from over here in the Republic? Uh, in my view, most of the operations by the hardline IRA are mounted from the Republic, in my judgment. That is not to say that there are not some minor operations which are actually planned and carried out within South Armagh. I think the really hardline stuff is planned south of the border. The Army believes one of its principal security difficulties is the sanctuary available for the IRA just across the border in the Republic. And there are just not enough soldiers to police the maze of roads and crossings. The Colonel has one battalion of 600 men. How many more would be needed? I think if you were going to absolutely separate South Armagh, you know, you could easily eavesdrop on the battalion. Uh, but in no way, uh, with that middle of the screen machine, but that is the sort of pick up one would need. And to that extent, the security problem is insoluble. No, I don't believe that's so uh, at all. I don't believe the security problem is totally all it goes between the two hills. Uh, we do need a uh, political will towards the solution to help us. We do need the people to uh, cooperate with us. And if these things happen in conjunction with the military effort, then I do not believe that things are so. Newton Hamilton is another of South Armagh's small towns. It's been bombed so much that today it's a hollow shell of a place. 
Forum spricht vor Arm. Clearly Spring. The Charge Magazine Lord. This Royal Scots Patrol is about to set up a checkpoint on the roads outside the town. You probably know that Newton Hamilton's most bomb village in Northern Ireland. It's had so many car bombs and the devastation in the town itself is just unbelievable. There's something like uh, one out of every ten buildings left standing, and the other nine are just rubble that's lying about the streets. What do you think life is like for them? Well, it can't be much. I mean, they're stopped at a barrier when they go out in the morning. When they come home from work in the evening, they're stopped at a barrier and their car starts. But they just seem to be up with it, they adapt to it. So it doesn't worry them anymore, or it doesn't seem to anyway. Following the sectarian massacres of last week, the most visible of the army's activities is a deluge of road checks throughout our mark. The army is conducting these round the clock, and during the week they've been stopping and searching up to 5,000 vehicles a day. These checks seldom, if ever, reveal anything, but their psychological effects are judged to be important. They doubtless make it harder for the terrorists to move about, but their principal intention is to reassure this battered population that something is being done. The soldiers work the longest, most dangerous hours in the United Kingdom. When they're not out, they're shut up inside the cramped barracks of their outposts. Look, we're about 16 hours a day, you know, and that's every day. And by the end of the first week, you're feeling tired, and by the end of the second week, you're feeling tired, and the last week, and it just goes on for there, you know, so. How many vehicles do you think you've checked in all the time you've been here? Oh, for Well, if I got a couple of bob, you know, for everyone I'd done, I'd be quite happy with it. Yeah. If I got paid for the overtime of putting in stopping them, I'd be happy with it too. But the powers that be, you know. Have you got any ideas about the situation? Does it appear to be one to you that you can, uh, that you can help or make better, or how does it seem to you? Well, we might be able to make it better because that's why they send us here in the first place. I mean, I hope we're making it better, or we're just... The object of being here is just fail. How many people do you believe you're up against? How many gunmen are there? I think this really splits into two parts. We believe that those responsible for the psychopathic sectarian killings in our area operating from the south are probably in a group of about 12 strong. As far as the straightforward IRA terrorist is concerned, it's very difficult to estimate exactly how many we're up against, but I would believe uh, a figure of around 30 would be fairly accurate. Can Not I, very strong. Colonel, how important is it to you uh, and your men here to have more cooperation than you're getting from across the border in the Irish Republic with the security forces there. At the present time, we have very good cooperation with the Gardaí through the RUC. The Irish police? That's right. And I'm quite confident that really does work well. Does it work quickly enough for you? It does work quickly. And when we are operating actually in the border area, we can talk to the Gardaí on our radio sets. And uh, we certainly work together. As far as the Irish Army are concerned, regrettably, at the moment, there are, is no cooperation between ourselves and the Irish Army. Is it desirable and necessary that it should be, in your view? I think it's highly desirable and indeed necessary. The official view in the Republic has been that cooperation between the two armies is not necessary. I, I don't see the point of it. Uh, uh, we have a mission to perform. Presumably they have a mission as well. What their mission is, I don't know and I don't wish to know. We have a job to do, we do it in our own way. I'm satisfied that we do it well, and I'm satisfied that we're doing it effectively. And what about the SAS uh, squadron that you're said to be, to be getting? Is it here? As you know, Mr. Wilson has said that the SAS will be operating in South Armagh, and I'm afraid I cannot say any more about it. But and what, what specific capability can they, do they have, and, and which they will employ, that you haven't done so far? Uh, very little that we haven't done so far, but a particular role of theirs is covert surveillance, which they're very expert at. Which is going to give you information that you haven't been able to get so far from the local community. To a certain degree, though, one's got to be very careful about bringing in the local community here, because in the south of our area, 
It is strongly Republican in sympathy and no security forces will get very much help from the local community in that area. Day and night, in the wind and the rain of Armagh, the Royal Scots, the oldest regiment in the British Army, are doing what they can to cope with Britain's oldest problem. Trying to damp down bigger fires which might glow at any moment after last week's murders, the army is now galloping all over this little turbulent patch of the United Kingdom. A great deal has been tried in Northern Ireland and nearly all of it has failed. For many months there's been no British policy in the province other than to leave it to the people and politicians themselves to see what they could come up with. And what they've come up with so far to start the new year is sectarian butcheries. Up we offer. Up we offer, okay? Government policy allows the army only to respond to events. It can't take preemptive action. And the policy is under increasing attack. For in the present political vacuum, it's the gunmen who seem to control and force the debate. The freshly dug Protestant and Catholic graves in South Armagh will not change the basic situation in the province. Their attitudes are only hardening. But their principal political effect may prove to be in Dublin and Westminster, where the more cooperation between them has been made possible by the widening ring of murder in Armagh. Michael Charlton in South Armagh. In the Commons tonight, they're still debating Northern Ireland after the opening statement on security by Mr. Wilson and one by Mr. Rees on the future government of the province. As expected, Mr. Rees announced that the government was reconvening the Northern Ireland Convention for four weeks from February the 3rd. He'd be asking them to consider a white paper to be published soon, which called for more widespread acceptance throughout the community of some proposed system of government and some form of acceptable partnership and participation. Mr. Rees stood firm on British presence in Northern Ireland. He said a British withdrawal would be a grave mistake. It would lead to violence on an ever greater scale. Equally, he said, a united Ireland is not in the gift of this government. There's been a generally quiet reaction from Northern Ireland so far. Indeed, one of the leading Protestant paramilitary organisations, the UDA, went so far as to welcome the government's statements. Michael Charlton has just talked to the Prime Minister at 10 Downing Street. Prime Minister, despite the tribute you paid to the Dublin government in the House uh, this afternoon, do you believe that what is happening in Armagh and over the border could be better contained with coordinated help from the Irish Army? And is it a matter of regret to you that that so far has not been possible? We are satisfied with the big improvements that have been developing, including those worked out by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland with the Southern Ireland Minister of Justice as recently as last Thursday. That is police cooperation. And of course it can be flashed through. And I think this is going to improve. The problem about the, the army, their army has a different kind of role from ours, uh, traditionally. They have no legal powers under their acts of parliament uh, to enable them to get involved in anti-terrorist activities of this kind. Yes, I think it could help if they had those powers. Though what we are in fact very pleased about is that they are, and I hope this will go through, carrying legislation which will enable them to put on trial in the South people who commit crimes like those ghastly brutalities last week uh, that uh, you uh, went over to <coughs> inquire into, uh, following which the perpetrators then sort of crossed the border perhaps a few minutes later. Now they can be put on trial in the south under this new legislation. But the army made a pretty strong point I think in the film that yes. assistance from the Irish army, coordinated help would be would be assist, uh, of assistance to them, and it I would. wonder whether you feel it's, it's, it it's, would. you I regret think, it's not possible. It would. I don't think there's much prospect of it at the moment, but we have greatly stepped up the cooperation, which can be within a matter of seconds now, between the police forces on both sides. Now, Prime Minister, looking back over the last 12 months, I think many people must be very perplexed and baffled by what's happened. You, you've bent over backwards in buying time in Northern Ireland. You, you've ended detention. Um, and yet we've had a ceasefire in which 246 people have been killed and 1,600 injured in that period. 
Hasn't the present policy of buying time about come to an end? No, we haven't had a ceasefire. Nothing to do with us. The uh, IRA provisionals announced they were having a ceasefire, and there wasn't much sign of it last week in the scenes we've just witnessed on the film. In fact, there were considerably fewer deaths last year, and many of those were, well, the um, ultra-Protestants shooting it out with the ultra-Catholics, and sometimes fighting within the two so-called religious communities. I think what's going on is a very big perversion, what all of us understand uh, by religion. Uh, what has been, I think, very successful last year was getting people up in court, getting them found guilty and sentenced by the courts themselves. That's far better than discretionary internment or detention by the Secretary of State. But you have tried a very great deal, as I say, tension ended, you've bent over backwards to, uh, to remove the principal obstacle as far as the Irish nationalists were concerned, and yet the province comes up with massacres to begin the new year. So, I mean, yes, again I ask you, hasn't the present policy just about come to an end? No, no, indeed, what we are doing and tightening up all the time has been going on. We, I announced in Parliament today seven broad areas where we're really toughening it up, in addition to sending the Spearhead Battalion to County Armagh and, of course, uh, the, the SAS, uh, whose role was just touched upon in your interview, and uh, neither the Colonel, quite rightly, nor I are going to say any more about it than that. But you rightly said in the province. You see, these murders were on both sides. The first five, whose funerals we saw, all were moved by it on television last week, those are five Catholics shot in their homes. The following day, there was a vicious reprisal and ten Protestants peacefully on their way home from work. The Armagh problem is a special one. That is why we are treating it as a special emergency area with very special and all the time tightening uh, security and military controls. With the Daily Mirror, which is a strong supporter of the Labour Party and Labour governments, uh, as you know, came out this week and said that you had no fresh thinking um, throughout uh, this last few months um, and that the only realistic course for you to take now is to set a, um, a timetable and hand over inevitably to a Protestant state that perhaps in the north. I mean, are you well, contemplating is, anything like that with uh, public opinion polls supporting what the that, mayor is saying? That is, in fact, what the IRA are demanding. If, if we had said publicly in the hearing of the IRA, uh, IRA on radio, television or statement in Parliament that we are going to pull out our troops in a measurable period of time, they would have said, this is what we're after. And then, of course, all hell would have been let loose uh, when we carried it out. Uh, but there are two communities, the extremists of both of them are utterly evil, and it is the duty in a United Kingdom, which we are, of the state, of the government, of the security forces to protect the lives of peaceable people. I think one gain last year, a very clear gain, uh, and this is why things have been a bit different in some parts of Northern Ireland, apart from County Armagh, has been that more and more, for example, of the Catholic population, but not only them, have got sick to the teeth of gunmen and are not providing them help, not providing them a, a shelter to go to when they're being chased by the security forces were trying to arrest them. But, um, and we've got to win hearts and minds here as well, uh, as well as... Uh, but there's not much evidence that that's having any effect, is it? You see, the general thrust well, of it your is, policy... Well, it is, because in fact, the IRA, for example, last year, were, were much more confined and concentrated, had to rely much more on going down to the south. But I'd just like to return oh. to the principal thrust of the policy is that to leave it to them. They must come up with a solution in the province themselves, and yet day after day they prove that they can't. Things seem to be no, getting worse, and we're getting in deeper. No, I think you've got to divide this. There are two things. I say this in Parliament. It doesn't matter what political or constitutional solution somebody thinks up or agrees on if we, can't, if we don't get the security situation right by enabling people to move freely without the danger of being shot. But equally, all the security measures in the world are not going to provide uh, an answer just by the repression we have to try to do, suppression. But here is a charge no, this may, week. No, but sorry, may I just say this? Until last year, successive governments, we strongly supported the Conservatives, they've supported us equally fairly, have, were trying to get a solution that we worked out in Westminster. Last year it all broke down, 1974 rather, middle of 74. So we said, all right, get on with it. We, you elect yourself a convention, produce an answer. They've produced one now, and Parliament at this moment is debating the solution they put up, and we've asked them to meet again and try and iron out some of the 
try and remove some of the bugs in that proposal. We'd be glad if they can produce a solution, because there's one thing about Ulster, uh, whether the Catholics, Protestants, IRA, UDA, UVF, they're not going to have Westminster telling them what to do. On the other hand, as part of the United Kingdom, we can't allow anyone to impose a solution now which is not fair to all communities. But are you prepared to, to rule and impose a solution in the wider interests of civilized well, order in tried. this country and in the Republic? We've tried, we've tried to impose one. We're now trying to let, we're giving them a chance to work it out. They say, let's have an Ulster solution. Well, all right, let's see how that goes. I think we're right to do that. Meanwhile, we are, uh, in a very determined way, tightening up security, particularly in this area, the difficulties of which were very, very clear, very clear to me from this film. Uh, and we're doing this to get the security situation as far as possible, knave-proof and foolproof. But aren't, isn't the reality that you're faced now with an indefinite period of, of direct rule? And shouldn't you be alerting the people of this country uh, to the consequences it of isn't that? Necessarily uh, a renewed it IRA campaign, more deaths, more bombing. It isn't necessarily the case that there will be a long period of direct rule. We want to see them have some kind of government of their own province, subject to the overriding power of Westminster and the overriding authority of the United Kingdom Parliament and government. Uh, we've given them a chance to work out a solution. It's too early to say whether they'll succeed in getting one that can be accepted by all communities. But isn't that just a, a, a tactical um, position that you've taken? I mean, do you look beyond uh, the next month or six oh, weeks to a solution beyond that? It I'm, well, I'm well known for always looking... Uh, beyond uh, tactical solutions, but that didn't stop me spending nearly all of last week dealing with the immediate tactical solution, uh, which was highlighted by those brutal murders last week. Merlin Reese, Secretary of State, said in the House this afternoon, U United Ireland, he said, is not in the gift of this Parliament. Um, does that mean that despite all this um, the intransigence of the Protestants, uh, that you're still not prepared to rule that out? Sometimes in opposition we discuss the possibility. This is one thing perfectly plain to me. Uh, the uh, Southern Irish Parliament, the Southern Irish Government, wouldn't be seen dead with the, that lot in the North as they regard them. Uh, certainly this is not a practical proposition. It's not one that any party in Britain would want to impose Do you rule unless it, it were accepted. I don't rule it out as a solution in the millennium, and I hope a rather shorter period than that someday. But it is not part of our present policy. The North doesn't want it big majority do not want it in the north and many Catholics don't. The south certainly don't want it. They only wish they could be a few thousand miles further away from the people in the north and probably vice versa. Prime Minister, thank you. Prime Minister talking to Michael Charlton about this.